Here he is, the one, the only... Oh, that's me. He was comedy's great anarchist, a sharp, rude thorn in the hide of American propriety. And funny enough, we loved him for it. Now, what do you got to say to me? Just this, can you sleep on your stomach with such big buttons on your pajamas? This is my aunt, and she's come to talk over some old family matters. I wish I had an aunt look like that. Well, take it up with your uncle. Groucho reveled personally in, in, in knocking everything and everybody. He would uh, make uh, outrageous statements or do outrageous things. This would be a better world for children if the parents had to eat the spinach. He was the original rebel. I don't know what they have to say. It makes no difference anyway. Whatever it is, I'm against it. No matter what it is or who commenced it, I'm against it. Groucho, certainly, uh, mainly, had such a wonderful arrogance. He was against uh, anything that was normal. Your proposition may be good, but let's have one thing understood. Whatever it is, I'm against it. And even when you've changed it or condensed it, I'm against it. It was uh, very disrespectful. Remember, you're fighting for this woman's honor, which is probably more than she ever did. He made fun of most everything. Uh, nothing seems sacred. What do you say, uh, are we all going to get married? All of us? All of us. But that's bigamy. Yes, and that's bigamy, too. An insult from Groucho was only an insult in quotes. It was part of his character. I'm opposed to it. On general principles, I'm opposed to it. For months before my son was born, I used to yell from night till morn, whatever it is, I'm against it. And I've kept yelling since I first commenced it. I'm against it. Boogie, boogie, boogie. He was ahead of his time, really. He was a, a really a, a kind of a renaissance humorist. I felt he was one of the brightest men overall that I've ever met. She seemed to have so much confidence. He was a parent. He was, he was very funny at times. He was very serious at times. He was very moody. He had a streak of sentimentality, Groucho did. Um, he kept friends an awfully long time. He was a depressed man who suffered, I think, not only clinical bouts of depression, but uh, well, problems with his family and wives. I have never seen Groucho. Uh, when his guard was down. From the vaudeville stage to Broadway, from movies to radio to You Bet Your Life on television, Groucho Marx ruled the comet roost for the better part of seven decades. For a poor Jewish boy without an education, it was his escape from poverty and his entree into the world of art. His wit was exhilaratingly destructive. It spared no one who crossed its path. No pomposity was safe in, in Groucho's presence. His skill at puncturing the pompous balloon was, was marvelous. And you can say it was a real love match. We married for money. Hey, my shrinking violet? Say, it wouldn't hurt you to shrink 30 or 40 pounds. Oh, you impudent head. I'll report you to your paper. I'll thank you to let me do the reporting. Is it true you're getting a divorce as soon as your husband recovers his eyesight? Is it true you wash your hair in clam broth? Is it true you used to dance in a flea circus? This is outrageous! Throughout his life, he sought the companionship of writers because in his deepest heart, he wanted to be acclaimed as an author, not a performer. A romantic, he married for love and drove his wives away with his caustic tongue. For Groucho, Comedy was an offensive weapon he used as a defense against an often hostile world. Everybody's trying to ingratiate himself with the audience, like Groucho. He took such a chance at being disliked. Why, I've never been so insulted in my life. Well, it's early yet. $9.40, this is an outrage. If I were you, I wouldn't pay it. 
He would turn from the screen to the audience. He was the one that did the first asides I'd ever seen. I love good music. So do I. Let's get out of here. Sit down. I've got to stay here. But there's no reason why you folks shouldn't go out into the lobby till this thing blows over. The high literary quality of the humor, oh boy, highly sophisticated, but combined with extremely broad physical humor. But it wasn't physical comedy that made Groucho famous. It was his incomparable way with words. Groucho could exist only in sound. Unlike Charlie Chaplin, the master of silent comedy. I played tennis with Charlie Chaplin. And Charlie, he turned around to me and he said, gee, I envy you. I said, you envy me? Why? He says, I wish I could talk on the screen the way you do. And I found this kind of, such an ironical statement. And he was the, the greatest comedian, I think, that there's ever been. Stage, screen, any place, clowns and every, all over the world. There's never been anybody as good as him. And he's sitting there envying me because I could talk. And now, on with the opera. Let joy be unconfined. Let there be dancing in the streets, drinking in the saloons, and necking in the parlor. Play, Don. Uh, the idiocy of, the way, of his way of thinking which was so wonderful. In all my years of medicine, oh, I have... Your years of medicine? Why, you don't know the first thing about medicine. And don't point that beard at me, it might go off. In the films, Groucho was the theater of the absurd. His, per his perception on, on reality, that was, seemed so surreal to me. Pardon me while I have a strange interlude. Why, you couple of baboons? What makes you think I'd marry either one of you? Uh, the best one I think I ever did was an animal crackers where I had a scene where we had gone to Africa to hunt. We was, I was supposed to be a huntsman or something. And uh, first morning I said, we, uh, we got up at six o'clock in the morning, had a good breakfast, and we're back in bed at seven. That was the opening line. And then, then we went hunting and I caught an elephant. I caught an elephant in my pajamas. How he got in my pajamas, I'll never know. <laughs> And then I said, I had this elephant, I didn't know what to do with them, because I wanted to remove the tusks, because, and they're very difficult to remove from an elephant, because they're very powerful and very strong. I says, on the other hand, in Alabama, the Tuscaloosa, and I think that's as good a point. <laughs> There's a certain musical rhythm that they had, that the Marx Brothers really had, and he's retained that rhythm. He would tell certain jokes over and over, and what was magnificent was they always had that perfect, you know, that perfect timing. It is so distinctive. And the, the rhythms and uh, uh, the, the readings, they, they were very special. But that all stems from, from a sense of music. Hello, I must be going. I cannot say I came to say I must be going. I'm glad I came, but just the same, I must be going. La la. You know, he was not an overnight sensation. He was a person that, and his brothers, you know, were doing the same thing for years and years and years before they really caught on. I mean, in vaudeville, they were okay. In 1905, 14-year-old Julius Henry Marx began his show business career as a boy singer in vaudeville. By 1915, Groucho and his brothers had developed their lunatic comic style on the vaudeville circuit. And he would come up with lyrics to songs that he sang in vaudeville with his brothers, a little thing called Peasy Weezy. Went fishing last Sunday and I caught a smelt. Put him in the pan and the fire he felt. Of all the smells I ever smelt. Well? I never smelt a smell like that smell smelt. Peasy Weezy, what's his name? Peasy Weezy, Peasy Weezy, what's his game? He will get you if he can. Peasy Weezy, Peasy is a bold bad man. Oh, 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 o
speaking of audible, those old jokes, they survive because they're so good. They're great. That's why they survive. There used to be a joke about a, an actor was playing in Baltimore in a small town, and he got laryngitis. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's looking for a doctor. He didn't know anybody. He walks along the suburbs of this little town. He finally comes to a, a cottage, and there's a sign outside. It says, Dr. Smith or Brown or something. And he can't talk very well. And he rings the bell, and a very pretty woman comes to the door, who is the wife of the doctor. And she opens the door, and he says, uh, is the doctor in? And she says, no, come on in. <laughs> Gradually, Groucho created his classic character. In 1921, late for a show and with no time to paste on his fake mustache, he dabbed grease paint on his upper lip before running on stage. With his darting stooped walk, the long cigar, the painted mustache, and the leering eyebrows, the Groucho persona was now complete. He had given his entire youth to the back-breaking demands of vaudeville. The dressing rooms were terrible, the money was awful, uh, they would close a show in the middle of the week if they didn't like it. Uh, oh yes, it was a very, very hard life, very hard life. The brothers had made the transition from vaudeville headliners to Broadway stars when their first full-length play, The Coconuts, opened in New York in 1925. Really older folks, the really lucky ones, got to buy tickets to Broadway, sit there, look at that curtain with the gold fringe and the warm lights on it, and the house lights went down, and know that the curtain was going to go up, and the four young Marx brothers were going to come out on stage and revolutionize comedy. It was totally known. It was totally known. In 1929, The Coconuts was filmed. Groucho was just short of 40 when his illustrious movie career began. I mean, they broke down so many of these walls that people would like, oh my God, are they really doing that? Brothers made the coconuts. Monkey business. Horse feathers. And duck soup for Paramount. Then moved to MGM for a night at the opera and a day at the races. When I was a kid, uh, living in San Francisco, they had a wonderful theater called the Golden Gate Theater that showed a movie and a stage show. And every once in a while, the Marx Brothers would come up to the Golden Gate Theater, do five shows a day, little scenes from their upcoming movie that they had not shot yet. And I got to see Day at the Races where they Papered, they wallpapered poor Margaret Dumont into the wall five times a day. This was a perfectionist. This was not someone who just goes out there and tries a joke, and if it doesn't work, you know, too bad. No, no, no. If it doesn't work, he either perfects it that it does work, or it's gone. He was probably the best editor of comedy that I've ever seen. You don't know. I don't want to talk to you about this again, you snob. I'd horsewhip you if I had a horse. And you're willing to pay him $1,000 a night just for singing? Why, you can get a phonograph record of Minnie the Mooch for 75 cents. For a buck and a quarter, you can get Minnie. Even before I was in show business, when I used to watch the scenes, I had this, like, quiet little kind of uh, sadness for any other actor who had the, the, almost the nerve to be in the scene with them. But after all, we must remember that art is art. Still, on the other hand, water is water, isn't it? And east is east, and west is west. And if you take cranberries and stew them like applesauce, it tastes much more like prunes and rhubarb does. Now, uh... Now you tell me what you know. He cared for all of his brothers. 
Uh, my father told me to stay away from my brothers. My mother told my brothers to stay away from me. Of course, we, this didn't work out because we were pretty successful working together, and oddly enough, we're still very good friends. We see each other all the time. There were five Marx Brothers in all. Chico, real name Leonard, arrived in 1887. A year after came Adolf, later known as Harpo. Groucho was born on October 2nd, 1890. Two years later, Milton, or Gummo, was born. And the fifth brother, Herbert, or Zeppo, was born in 1901. I think there was a favorite brother, who was Harpo. He's got about a 15% metabolism with an overactive thyroid and a glandular affectation of about 3%. That's bad. With a 1% mentality. He's what we designate as the uh, crummy moronic type. I would always used to say when I was growing up and it got kind of difficult around our house because of my parents and the fighting, I would say I wish that Harpo was my father. I would bicycle over when it got really difficult at our house and I would, it would be hectic and screaming and carrying on with kids. But there was a peacefulness in the air. You've always said that Chico was the most interesting of the brothers. I've heard you say oh, that. Oh, yes. He had a brilliant mind, Chico. If Chico had gone into mathematics or something, he would have been at one someplace in New England, you know, in one of those. MIT or something. MIT or one of those. Now, here is a little peninsula, and uh, here is a viaduct leading over to the mainland. Why a dog? I'm all right. How are you? I say, here is a little peninsula, and here is a viaduct leading over to the mainland. All right. Why a dog? I'm not playing ask me another. I say that's a viaduct. All right. Why a dog? It's what I, why a dog? Why are no chicken? Oh. Uh, I don't know why I know chicken. I'm a stranger here myself. All I know is that it's a viaduct. You try to cross over there in a chicken and you'll find out viaduct. Chico was far too irresponsible. Too much of a gambler for Groucho's tastes. He was, he was a scalawag and a, and, a, and a gambler. Well, Chico, even though he was a gambler and was broke almost all the time, Chico was so broke at the time that he lost his membership in a Hillcrest Country Club. And it, that was his... his uh, a water hole. He'd be there every day playing bridge or whatever he, he played, Jim Mummy. And here he was no longer a member. Well, Groucho and Harpo chipped in and restored his membership, bought it back for him. So there were very close ties. And all his life he remained amazed and somewhat envious at Chico's phenomenal success with women. There's a rather well-known story, but it never hurts to repeat it. When young Tallulah Bankhead hit New York, she was the great, great aristocratic beauty and daughter of an important politician. And Chico had always wanted to meet her, as the story goes. And uh, Groucho said they uh, met at a party, but people had warned him, now don't do your usual crude approach to women, which in your case always works. Um, and that they met, and that the conversation was quite civil. Miss Bankhead, Mr. Marks, and so on. And as everyone was breathing a sigh of relief, Chico said, you know, I really want to fuck you. And she said, and so you shall, you old-fashioned boy. <laughs> now I'll tell you, doctor. My brother thinks he's a chicken. And we don't talk him out of it because we need the eggs. Hey, you look like the fellow used to be my brother. <laughs> I don't think I got your name. No, I got my name. <laughs> I think you're pulling my leg. Yeah, just to get him even. Well, would you mind helping me push this camera store around? <laughs> I'm sorry, I gotta go to the golf course and lay down in the sand trap. Sand trap? Yeah, you see, it's a Sunday, and that's when I see my psychiatrist. <laughs> I'm sure I used to know him. If I'm not mistaken, we both had the same mother. <laughs> Roger's mother, Minnie Marks, would forever be the dominant woman in his life. She had left Germany as a teenager to come to America, and at 19 married Simon Marx, a sweet, ineffectual tailor from Alsace. The flirtatious, ambitious Minnie was a classic stage mother. A frustrated performer herself, she pushed her children into show business and became their manager. Now, how would you analyze me? You all... Every time I see you with a cigar in your mouth, 
I think of all the frustrations you had as a child and the wrong kind of a bottle that they gave you. Madam Miss Allen, may interest you to know that I never had a bottle. And he said, yeah, Harpo inherited all of my mother's good qualities. Which is an interesting thing to say, because she was a bit of a horror, I mean, the way she forced those boys into the business. I know that uh, the boys all adored Minnie. And Minnie was the takeover person in that family. You know, she bleached the boys' hair to make them look less Jewish. She was responsible for their careers. And they say that your attitude toward women has to do with your mother. And one sad thing that I learned about Groucho once from a relative was that his... They said that his mother made it clear that he was the least favorite brother, or least favorite son. I don't know a thing about women, Groucho once said. I'm a sucker for a pretty face. Show's over. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> we will see you again some other time. Groucho was very fond of, of women. He really was. He liked women, but um, not to pal around with. One of them goes around with a black mustache. So do I. If I had my choice, I'd go around with a little blonde. He had girls. He, he dated a lot of girls, and I didn't like any of them because uh, they were, well, because probably I was jealous, but also because they were young and dumb. You know, you two girls have everything. You're tall and short and slim and stout and blonde and brunette. And that's just the kind of a girl I crave. He loved women, but he was a sexist. He didn't think of women as friends. Where's all those farmers' daughters I've been hearing about for years? He always said to me, don't throw the ball like a girl. Throw the ball like a boy. Don't play tennis like a girl. Play tennis. Everything had to be like a boy. And so I grew up thinking that males were superior. Are you a man or a mouse? You put a piece of cheese down there and you'll find out. You see, I'm not happy with my husband. Uh, he should have married some little housewife. Madam, I resent that. Some of my best friends are housewives. Well, let's not waste any time. Why don't the three of us neck? No. <laughs> That's the first time I ever enjoyed saying no. And that's yourself. the first time I ever enjoyed hearing it. Enjoy yourselves, darling. It's later than you think. That's what I say. It's later than you think. Come on, chillin. Let's neck. Groucho, Ethel does not neck, and neither do I. Speak for yourself, darling. <laughs> Just what they say it for, I never knew. It's just inviting trouble for the poor sucker who says I love you. Are you a great lover, would you say? Have you been all your life? I'm a miserable lover. That's why I've been married three times. <laughs> I'm an ardent lover, but an ineffectual one. <laughs> Do you believe in marriage? Do I believe in marriage? Not as much as I used to. Everything that ever grew The goose and the gander and the gosling too The duck upon the water when he feels that way too Says That's a wise quack You keep your bill out of this How would you like it if I butted into your affairs and laid an egg? He married young women, good-looking women He was 30 when he married 19-year-old Ruth Johnson they stayed together 22 years. Ruth, he had, he had married for early, very early on. I think she was in the chorus in one of the shows. She would come home from the tennis club, which is where she did a lot of her drinking, and then he would start arguing with her and making her look foolish. And it wasn't hard to make her look foolish because she was drunk. But he married two more women who were alcoholic, so it leads me to believe that he liked the feeling of being able to... Do he was able to dominate these women. In 1945, the 55-year-old Groucho married 22-year-old Kay Gorsey. That one lasted six years. Kay and I were friends before my father married her. She would come to see me, only it began to dawn on me that she was not really coming over to the house to see me, she was coming to see my father. 
And then one night, uh, I ring a call. She didn't come to see me at all. She went right straight into my father's room and spent the evening with him. And so that kind of gave me a little clue that, no, I knew. And he tried to boss her around and tell her what to do and, and treated her like a kind of a jerk. And, uh, and she really wasn't. She was just, she wasn't well educated or anything. He had a happy time in the morning marketing. And one day she said to him, Grouch, you, I'm your wife. You've never let me go marketing. So he said, okay, he gave her $100 and off she went to the market. And there were shortages, you know, during the war. She came back very proudly. She had a carton of toilet tissue and a cocker spaniel puppy. And that was the last time that he ever let her go marketing. His final marriage, which took place when he was 64, was to 20-year-old Eden Hartford. When she left him, 14 years later, Eden told a friend she would have stayed if only once he'd told me he loved me. He put her down, too, because she would be drinking, and he didn't understand about alcoholism. And she wasn't very smart, and there was a vast age difference, and they had no child to bring them together. I was very fond of all three of them. Uh, they divorced him, happily, I think. Though Groucho's relationships with women never worked out, on screen, he found his perfect match in the formidable Margaret Dumont. I shall never get married before my daughter. You did once. Towering, proud, and profoundly obtuse, in film after film, she navigated the stormy seas of Groucho's abuse. I can see you right now in the kitchen, bending over a hot stove. But I can't see the stove. Did Margaret Dumont find you funny? She played the, as everybody knows, the dowager. No, she never lady. understood anything I did on the stage. <laughs> Is that so? She didn't really. She thought I was serious. <laughs> I feel you are the most able statesman in all Fredonia. Well, that covers a lot of ground. Say, you cover a lot of ground yourself. You better beat it. I hear they're going to tear you down and put up an office building where you're standing. You can leave in a taxi. If you can't get a taxi, you can leave in a huff. If that's too soon, you can leave in a minute and a half. The yes, last show I did with her was the Hollywood Palace. <laughs> the principal animals inhabiting the African jungle are moose, elks, and knights of Pythias. <laughs> of course, you all know what a moose is. That's big game. First day, I shot two bucks. That was the biggest game we had. Don't step on those few laughs I have on. Tell what? me. Where are I? Oh, you're Did still you here? Did you meet any wild boar? Not until I saw you. Oh. <laughs> Tell me this. Do you hunt bear? Are you kidding? I always wear a bikini. Oh. <laughs> and two days later, she died. And, she and died the last the show she did was with me on the Hollywood Palace. How did you have the time to, to really uh, uh, bring up a family uh, the way a normal father Because would? I enjoyed it. I, I didn't do it as a duty. I had two small children that I was crazy about, and uh, I don't think I made any sacrifices. If Groucho increasingly ignored his wives, he doted on his children, making sure they got the attention he'd been deprived of as a child. Arthur, who would later write two books about his father, was the firstborn. Miriam arrived six years later. He was a very devoted father, very caring father. Uh, he was the kind of father who always took me everywhere. He was very involved in our lives. Clothes-wise, he wasn't real great on clothes. I would say, I need a new dress. And he'd come into my closet and look and say, well, the, the hem on that can be lowered. He didn't understand that you can't keep going to school in the same outfit or one or two outfits every single day. One of their neighbors went to the same high school I did, and one day, the step-grandmother told me that she, the little girl came home from school and said, well, who does she think she is? Just because she's Groucho Marx's daughter, she can wear that one outfit all the time? <laughs> Why do you think it is that so many of the, of the youngsters of, of the famous uh, names get into trouble? Well, I think it's partly uh, what they see at home. If they see the parents boozing, the kids are apt to grow up and drink. And... Uh, we weren't drinkers. I never was a drinker. Well, I'm, I'm going to be perfectly honest and tell you that I'm a recovering alcoholic. And so uh, until I got to the program that I'm in, a uh, recovery program, I really didn't learn a lot about life, about myself. And when I, when I got sober and started learning, he was dead by then. With second wife Kay, Groucho had Melinda, born in 1946. 
when, his, when Melinda was born, he and I were in the hospital waiting, in the waiting room. And the nurse came in and said that he had a little baby daughter. And he looked at me and he said, don't worry, Miriam, she'll never replace you. <laughs> Candy Bagan and Melinda Marks. Now, which one is Candy Bagan? I'm Candy Bergen. Oh, and you must be Melinda Marks, huh? Candy and Melinda and I will sing a song that we've been carefully rehearsing for the past three weeks. <laughs> Musical demon, such a honey dreamer, won't you play me some rag? Just like a beautiful rag, is like a beautiful drag. If you will play from a copy of the tune that is choppy, you'll get all my applause. And that is simply because my honey baby is simply crazy about rag. Musical demon, set your honey a dream, and won't you play me some rag? Just change that classical like nag to some sweet beautiful rag. If you will play from a copy of a tune that is choppy, you'll get all my applause. And that is simply because I want to listen to rag. Melinda hated the spotlight and fled Hollywood. I asked her why she ran off so many times. Very often, he didn't know where she was. He'd hire private detectives to find her. But he kept pushing her into areas that he, she didn't think she could handle. Groucho was happiest in the company of writers. He worked with the great Broadway playwright, George S. Kaufman, on The Coconuts and Animal Crackers. You know, George Kaufman hated writing for them. He did it, but he hated it uh, because Groucho would change it. But it always worked. Well, you don't change George Kaufman, you know, unless you're pretty damn good. He said, you know, uh, Kaufman said to me once, my, my greatest compliment, uh, you're the only actor I'd allow to ad lib in something I wrote. Groucho's best friend, journalist Arthur Sheikman, collaborated with Groucho on books and sketches. Also in the Groucho inner circle were screenwriter Nunnally Johnson, songwriter Harry Ruby, and Nat Perrin, whom Groucho brought to Hollywood to work on monkey business. With longtime friend Norman Krasna, he wrote his only play, Time for Elizabeth. I think Groucho would rather have been a successful and famous writer than as a performer. And he, oddly enough, would refer to himself as a writer. He, he wrote well. As a writer, Groucho's published works included memoirs, letters, and a comical look at the IRS. And he had kept up correspondence with so many people, and world-famous people, and uh, world-famous writers. I was on one of the night shows. I don't want to mention the name of the show. It was the Johnny Carson show. <laughs> I had mentioned that I had written a book, a book of letters, it's called, by Groucho Marx, with all these notable people on. And the next day, I got a letter from the head of the Congressional Library in Washington. Not a letter, phone call. And they asked me if they could have the original letters, which I sent to them. And if any time you're in Washington, you go to the Congressional Library, and you can read my book there. And it's two cents a day, by the way. <laughs> this is true. I'm probably the only actor in the last 40, 50 years that had a book in the Congressional Library. Well, I'm very proud of that. He, he never seemed to like when a letter stopped. There was always a P.S. in every letter I've got from him. It would be an utter, witty, funny, strange non sequitur. he have been talking about Alexander Wolcott, because I'd asked about Wolcott, and this wonderful prose he wrote about Wolcott. He talked about him for great length and said, I hope this answers most of your questions. I have to go now, Groucho. P.S. Have you ever noticed that Peter O'Toole has a double phallic name? And he was not a formally educated person. And uh, I think it, it bugged him. Didn't bug anybody else. We used to go to school in the morning. My mother always fixed sandwiches for us in the morning to go to school because we lived in 93rd and the school was at 93rd. But by the time we got to school, we were hungry again. <laughs> so we always ate our lunch and then we went home and had lunch again in 93rd. <laughs> My mother was always so astonished. She's like, prepared lunch for you, why don't you eat it? She says, we ate that on the way to school. <laughs> this is why I didn't get an education. 
<laughs> and since you went to the University of Yale, I was thrown out of the hotel in New Haven. You can take great, great performers uh, of Laurel and Hardy or W.C. Fields or this and that, and that's a good way to point it out. No way that the intelligence or the literacy of what they were saying had anything to do with the result in comedy, great as it was, but it had everything to do with, uh, with Groucho. Where would this college be without football? Have we got a stadium? Yes. Have we got a college? Yes. Well, we can't support both. Tomorrow we start tearing down the college. But, but professor, professor, where, where will, will the, the students, students sleep? sleep? Well, they always sleep in the classroom. He had started his career as a boy soprano, and music remained a passion throughout his life. I love a piano, I love a piano, I'd love to have somebody play upon a piano, a grand piano, it simply carries me away, I know a fine way to treat a stein way, I love to run my fingers or the keys, the ivories and with the pedal, I'd love to meddle. When Paderewski comes his way I'm so excited If I'm delighted To hear that long-haired genius play Keep your finger Keep your bow Give me a P-I-A-N-O-O-O -O -O. I love to sit right Besides an upright Or a high-toned baby grand A couple of times I played piano uh, at uh, Groucho's house, and, and I remember one time specifically, there was other people in the room, I just thought I was the greatest thing since Paderewski because Groucho didn't say anything for about a minute, he just listened. I thought that was the height of compliments. He was quite musical, and he, he sang on key, and uh, he had it just a natural gift for that. <laughs> Lady, when her muscles start relaxing, up the hill comes Andrew Jackson. Lydia, oh Lydia, that encyclopedia, oh Lydia, the champ of them all. For to bet she will do a mazaka in jazz with a view of Niagara that nobody has. And I clear day you can see Alcatraz you can learn a lot from Lydia I don't, I don't believe that you could ever have been a real close and intimate friend of Groucho's he was friendly to a lot of people if you couldn't sing couldn't sing harmony but uh, people uh, like Harry Ruby I've had three letters from your friend Harry Ruby in as many I mean, days he's a congenital idiot <laughs> And a compulsive letter writer, he is. <laughs> Harry Ruby is the great songwriter also. Yeah, I thought I'd slip that in. He's a great friend of mine, too. Oh. And he's written virtually all the songs that I sing. This man is allegedly a composer and can only play in one key. <laughs> Irving Berlin only plays in one or two Beethoven keys. Beethoven played in every key. Yeah. yeah but he's not on the show. No. So. He's... <laughs> you know why, don't you? He wouldn't wait for this money. <laughs> Why did you put this lyric here? Don't you know the song yet? No, I don't know it by heart. Do you know it by the piano? Yeah. <laughs> Window cleaning's not a thing to rave about. It won't get you in the Hall of Fame. Now, wait a minute, you can do better than that, can't you? <laughs> what become of those fancy twirls of yesteryear? Groucho. Please don't pick on me. I play by ear the same as you sing. <coughs> you got what? Frog of my throat. Let's see. By God, he has, too. There was a time when he suddenly discovered Gilbert and Sullivan. Well, any time he came to his home, you had to listen to Gilbert and Sullivan. If you're having dinner there twice a a week and you have to listen to Gilbert and Sullivan each time it, it gets painful after a few months yum yum to think how entirely my happiness is wrapped up in that little parcel really it hardly seems worthwhile oh matrimony oh match 
What's the matter? Can't you see that I'm soliloquizing? We, we used to do a couple of little Gilbert and Sullivan things, because, you know, a lot of the material that was written for him was kind of Gilbert and Sullivan-y because it had all those wonderful quick little uh, words and, and things like that. Once he was doing Tit Willow and he came to the line, uh, if, if you remain callous and obdurate, I shall perish, and he stopped and he said, can I just stop the band for a minute? How many people in this audience know what obdurate means? And uh, I don't think any hands went up. And he said, I'm not going to finish a song for an illiterate audience. And if you remain callous and obdurate, I shall perish as he did. And you will know why. Though I probably shall not exclaim as I die. Oh, Willow, sit Willow. It will all... In the 40s, the Marx Brothers made indifferent movies for MGM and United Artists. Groucho, his first marriage over, was a lonely man, uncertain of his future and finding only sporadic work in radio. For a man who required the limelight and always worried about money, these were difficult days. He once said to M.F.K. Fisher, uh, we were terribly poor boys, four in a bed, so forth and so forth. And he said, if I'm ever poor again, I'll have to kill myself. He said, I can't, I can't handle it. I stand here shocked that uh, you haven't been paid. No, I don't care. The money isn't important any as long as I get it. <laughs> <laughs> we three would make an ideal couple. Why, you've got beauty, charm, money. You have that money, haven't you? Because if you haven't, we can quit right now. He was always worried, even when he was well off, that he was going to wake up one morning and be broke. Hey, don't drink that poison. That's four dollars an ounce. I got cleaned out in 29. I had $250,000 saved from many years of rooms without bath and Greek restaurants. And uh, I lost it all in uh, 48 hours. Added to his insomnia was the fact that he could remember a light bulb burning in some part of the house. And he said, when you've been through the Depression, you, you get up and turn it off, no matter how wealthy you get. We haven't been paid in two weeks, and we want our wages. Wages? Do you want to be wage slaves? Answer me that. No. No, of course not. But well, what makes wage slaves? Wages. I want you to be free. Remember, there's nothing like liberty, except Collier's and the Saturday Evening Post. Be free, my friends, one for all and all for me, and me for you, and three for five, and six for a quarter. Groucho had a, had a long period where he didn't work, and he was a very, very unhappy man. Uh, there was Burns and Allen, there was Jack Benny, all of the great comedians, Milton Berle, were going great guns. You Bet Your Life brought Groucho renewed fame and fortune. It ran successfully for three years on radio and for 11 years on NBC television. The Groucho Show, or You Bet Your Life, uh, for want of a better title, um, was produced by a genius named John Goodell. There was a Walgreen two-hour show, radio show, in which there were a lot of stars and shows participated in it. Now, on this show was Art Linklater, and his partner is John Goodell. They've been together for many years on television and radio. And I did a scene with Bob Hope. And we both dropped the script on the floor and we started ad-libbing. And they ad-libbed for about 10 minutes, which is amazing. The amazing part is it wasn't dirty. You know, they were funny. And that amazed me. I wasn't thinking of Groucho as any possibility of doing a show where ad-libbing is involved. When I come off the stage, Goodell said to me, he says, hey, would you like to do a quiz show? And I said, well, I don't know, quiz show. That's about as low as you can sink in show business, isn't it, quiz show? And he said, well, um, I flopped four times on the radio. I might try anything. I'll be competing with refrigerators, but that's okay. Today, nobody would buy that show. You, you go in to sell the show and you say, hey, we got, a, we got a little guy with a mustache and glasses, and he sits on a stool and he talks to people, and then they do a little quiz. No way you would sell this. It was the first time any comedy... Uh, quiz format was used for a, basically a comedy show. We won the Peabody Award one year as the best comedy show, not the best quiz show. Ordinary people came on and he'd ask them an ordinary question and then he'd take their answer and twist it 
into what was really a comedy routine. Everybody came off second to Groucho. What about the men customers? Don't they ever try flirting with you? Oh, sometimes, no. but I show them my wedding ring. That only protects one finger. <laughs> we had the secret word. And that's an interesting thing, the secret word. Uh, I just threw it in before the show went on there. We used to have on people a funny alarm clock that would go off, and whenever it went off, somebody was talking would get a hundred dollars. I said, well, let's do something like that on this one. And so the first person who said the secret word went a hundred dollars. Well, it, it got into the, it got in dictionaries of the secret word. If any of our couples say the secret word, the duck will drop down and pay him a, a hundred extra bucks. Hi, duck, I haven't seen you lately. This is the word right here. Okay, ducky, go on back up there and hatch those eggs and drop them on Fenneman. <laughs> and that chemistry of George and Groucho was absolutely essential to make it work. And Groucho always said that I was the male Margaret Dumont. <laughs> what is the secret word, uh, Mr. Fenneman? Well, it's I'm going to call, now on, I'm going to call you Mr. Fenneman. All right, Groucho. Is that okay, George? That's, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> of course, perfume evaporates quickly, but the best way to use it is on the wrists, behind the ears, and in the fold of the elbows, and of course, if they really want to be sophisticated, behind the knees. <laughs> George, come out here. Lift up your feet. The thing that I remember most is the fear in the eyes of his contestants. Because, you know, it was like uh, being on a show with Spartacus. I would not have ever wanted to get into a one-in-one -in -one, uh, conversation uh, or, or an argument in front of people, let's say, a debate with Groucho. I would run. If he makes passes, he's liable to wind up getting married. Isn't this true, uh, Junior? <laughs> well, I don't think so. I think that if a man stays on his toes, he can stay single all his life. If he stays on his toes, yes. You didn't get the feeling of, of superiority. Or, get this one, you know, was that a zinger? Never. Never, never. I think that's why the people loved him. Well, in what way is your husband romantic, assuming that he is? Oh, man, have you ever been made love to by a Frenchman? <laughs> Not that I can recall. You Bet Your Life was the number one show on NBC for seven years. And it was on, you know, 15 years, uh, radio and television. You had a girl, I imagine. Well, uh, how do you mean that? <laughs> well, I meant it in the, in, in the nicest way you possibly could. He didn't like off-color humor. And... Uh, he always used to say to me, and I still believe this, he said, if a comic has to be dirty to be funny, then he's not funny. Sure, you can get a cheap, easy laugh by being dirty, but uh, I found out it wasn't worth it. And I don't want to be known as a dirty comedian in the end. All he had to do was raise his eyebrows, and whatever you said had another meaning, but he didn't say a word. What have you learned after being 25 years in politics? Well, the old-fashioned way is still the best. <laughs> I must have some reputation, you know. <laughs> there isn't anything anybody can say to me anymore that doesn't evoke some kind of a dirty laugh from the audience. <laughs> what do you mean by the old-fashioned way? Weren't you offered the lead in Oak Calcutta? <laughs> no, but I was invited there the opening night and I wouldn't go. And I told the man who wanted to take me that I don't want to see anything on the stage that I'm not doing at home. <laughs> I think it's apocryphal. I do, I really do. But it is, it, he could have said it. According to the story, and maybe it didn't appear on the air, we had this couple who had like 19 children. Um, he said, now, no, why, why do you have so many children? Uh, and the man said, well, I just like children. And Groucho said, well, I like my cigar, but I take it out of my mouth once in a while. <laughs> If Groucho became more culturally conservative with age, his politics were always to the left of center. 
Bratcher was a liberal. Harper was a liberal. And Chico bet on the Chicago White Sox. Nixon became his neighbor uh, almost across the street, I guess, in Truesdale Estates. And of course, they rushed to Groucho to ask him what he thought of that. And he said, better here than in the White House. He was very concerned with the Jewish uh, people in this world and, and felt very much, although he wasn't religious, that he was Jewish. We were talking about anti-Semitism and how prevalent it was in Hollywood and so forth. And so and he said, well, he said, I wanted to join the Santa Monica Beach Club. But they said, no Jews. So I said, look, my daughter's half Jewish. If we do join, can she go into the pool up to her waist? In his 80s, Groucho's health finally gave out, but not his vaudevillian spirit. He traveled to Cannes to receive the French Legion of Honor, and in 1974, accepted a special Oscar honoring his lifetime achievement. Slowed down by a stroke, and involved in a controversial relationship with his companion, Aaron Fleming, Groucho continued to perform. At Aaron's urging, the 82-year-old Groucho gave a one-man show before a sold-out crowd at Carnegie Hall. I think for him, toward the end, he always remembered Carnegie Hall as something very, very special, you know? And he had a, a wonderful, wonderful time. The evening uh, at Carnegie Hall was largely uh, anecdotes, and he just, uh, he talked, and uh, he came through the curtain carrying a violin. And he said, are you as tired of Jack Benny's music as I am? And he stomped on the violin. First of all, just coming out, I mean, he gets a five-minute standing ovation. People got there hours ahead of time just because they, didn't, they wanted the evening of, of Groucho to be uh, as long as possible. And there were mobs outside Carnegie Hall long before curtain time. There was rows of people who looked like Groucho. They came with the glasses. They came with the thing. They came with the, they came with the whole thing, you know, like this. He walks out to this, you know, I mean, he has no idea. And all of a sudden, as this place goes crazy, he sees rows of himself. Loved it. And I had to do this little overture for, you know, for the New York audience. So I decided, because it's Carnegie Hall, to come out and start with a Beethoven sonata. Okay? This is called the Wallenstein Beethoven sonata. This is for real. And I go out there and I go. People are saying to themselves, what does this have anything to do with Groucho Marx? And I'm, I'm playing my Beethoven. And then all of a sudden I go. And it had everything to do with Groucho Marx. It was funny, in the New York concert, when he sang, hello, I must be going, I started to feel you know, we're not going to have him around much longer, you know? And it was very poignant to hear him sing that. And um, I'm just glad that he could experience the love of the public to that degree toward the end of his life. I think there's, there's nothing greater than that. Near the end, I was over the house. I went over and I stuck my arms under his arms and I lifted him up. And then I'm kind of walking him back to the bed. And this little weak voice says, hey, Fenneman, you always were a lousy dancer. On this one occasion, UB came by and uh, Groucho came by with the, the, the young lady who was uh, his manager or whatever at the time. And I put the two of them together because I thought these two uh, old men of show business would really like looking at each other and talking. Well, nothing happened. They didn't say anything to each other. At dinner. And Groucho sits and UB sits and plays the piano. And UB goes through a whole... Uh, you know, a lot of songs, and finally, UB gets to I'm just one. And Groucho, who was like this, was coming up to the piano, and UB is playing, and Groucho is singing, and there, for the first time, this lady said, it was the first time that Groucho had gotten up to do anything like that. I think the nicest compliment I ever had that way was a, I was walking around, along the street in uh, Beverly and there was a Jewish woman on the side where I was and there was a Jewish man. Finally they stopped and the woman came up to me and she says, never die, just keep on living. Huh? 
Groucho Marx died on August 19, 1977, at age 86. He had spent a lifetime planting comic time bombs under our seats. The explosions of laughter he left us will be heard forever. When I think of him, interestingly enough, I don't think about him singing, I don't think about him being funny, I just think about him being very kind. I just sort of felt that he was saying, hey, you know, life is crazy and shh, little secret. I know it is and watch what I do. Groucho was special, terribly special. He was not just another funny man. Everybody who knew him said, you know, they worried about him and he would be lonely and he'd be depressed a lot. And um, He needed a Groucho Marx to cheer him up. He was the only person who couldn't have one. <laughs>